But here at home, Canadian prosecutors also routinely offer rap lyrics as criminal evidence, almost exclusively against black and indigenous men, might I add. So needless to say, free speech, free expression, it means a hell of a lot to me. And it should mean a hell of a lot to you too, because the ability to speak our individual truths and to be heard is our best defense against tyranny. It's often said that the best disinfectant is sunlight. In other words, you fight hate speech with free speech. Yes, you do, and you can and you should. But I also accept some limitations help defend against the tyranny of your fellow neighbor. And the question is, when is that? When, if ever, should we draw a line our own, on our own civil liberties? Journalists don't like to entertain this question very much because it's anathema to our profession. And frankly, because there is a history of hate speech laws or libel laws being used by groups like the Church of Scientology or the Canadian Islamic Congress or the Jewish Congress to challenge valid criticism. I certainly spend far more time thinking about free speech liberties than hate speech crimes. But the balance is something that I've been thinking about a lot lately, and the reason is also personal for me. I may not identify as a Muslim, but I come from a Muslim family. And every day I see how hatred and misinformation in the form of free speech makes them more unwelcome on a continent that they've been migrating to for four generations. It's, it's really quite amazing, actually. Really quite Muslim and Canadians, but that's, that's not actually quite true. Not, at least not for me. There, there was a spike in, of suspicion and ignorance followed by a decade of relative peace once the anxiety all washed away. But a few things converged in the last few years that suddenly made anti-Muslim hate speech tolerable, tolerable in the public. Like this, for instance. Um, when I say hate speech, pardon me. When I hate, say hate speech, I mean, I, I, I mean uh, words that incite violence. Uh, this is a meme that you might see out in the open on, on your Facebook, uh, but you can also order it on a shirt, in patches, or stickers. This had actually been spotted on uh, light poles in Quebec City around the time of the massacre at the Grand Mosque that killed uh, six men <coughs> while they had their backs turned uh, toward the shooter while they prayed. And I'm going to say their names. This will take me a moment. Abraham, Abraham Iberi, Mamoudou Tanuberi, Khalid, Khalid al Kasimi, Abu Bakr Tati, Abdul Karim Hassan, and Ezzedine Sufyan. So, to get to this point where you can do this with little or no consequence, I'm going to say no consequence. A few things had to happen. One, the rise of ISIS in the Arab world. Two, a historic refugee crisis. Three, the rise of inspired attacks in the Western world. And four, a shift in the function of social media toward, more, toward being more of a news platform. And, and this became the jet fuel for propaganda usually contained to fringe sites. Another thing happened too. Our political leaders started exploiting the confusion and fear for votes. They campaigned on burqa bans, on Muslim bans, on Canadian values tests. And I, I really believe this gave social license for the general public to put their prejudices out in the open, where they can intimidate. Uh, I asked Francis Henry, a, a writer and scholar, and a refugee of Hitler's Germany for an interpretation of this moment. 
What she said to me was, what are we to make of it other than there is a new scapegoat? And she said it in this defeatist tone, because here we are, 7 years 7, 75 years after the Jewish Holocaust 50 years after the civil rights movement and new hate groups are quickly forming and populating the western world with chapters across Canada in Edmonton in Calgary where there's this american style patriot group calling themselves the three percenters they monitor mosques and they openly discuss stockpiling arms and doing paramilitary training on facebook in the open, and the RCMP claimed they had never heard of them until a reporter from Vice magazine asked them for a statement. And by then, they had 150 members. So that's happening. And also, old hate groups are remobilizing. The imperial wizard of the KKK says, membership is growing faster since Donald Trump's inauguration than he can remember. All of them have found kindred spirits in this very loud anti-feminist movement that seeks to silence women's rights to justice. And also a reactionary Christian movement to slow down or block progress of LGBT and women's equality. Now, individually, these groups are not very strong. Some of them are fringe. But when they start allying together in, in their echo chambers, and they gain support from each other, and they start trading in neologisms and using the same vocabulary, the echo chamber gets bigger, and it starts to look like a new form of right-wing fascism. And if this were just contained to the interwebs, it, it wouldn't be so alarming, but as we saw in Charlottesville, Virginia, there are Nazis in public and in university squares. And hate crimes against Muslims are up 500% in two years in the United States with the highest numbers on record and 253% in, 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 in four years in Canada, also the highest numbers on record. And then Donald Trump, right? Sitting in the most powerful office of the world is this man who displays all the characteristics of an authoritarian leader exploiting this hatred, exploiting false news, and suppressing the free press by lambasting it as fake in order to keep his power. And that in itself would not be so terrifying if we didn't see democratic politicians, including here in Canada, imitating Trumpism with mixed results. If you believe in free speech as the ultimate protector of democracy, as I do, then you probably find some irony in this because speech has never been freer. It's never been more accessible and easier to publish. Our constitution has shed restrictions on speech over time, and speech is even freer in the legal sense because of it. So there's a lot of sunlight to, with which to disinfect. And yet, Facebook and Twitter, our main media sources, are cesspools of bigotry. And yet, if you were to follow the news, you'd think that we're having a crisis of censorship. My apologies to whoever this is in the picture. I don't know who you are, but yes, it's funny. It's funny, yes. But imagine that, right? I mean, we're, we're living in a time when we are exposed to more words, more ideas, more information than ever in the history of humankind, and more of it deemed offensive. And yet the narrative is, people can't speak their minds anymore. There's a chill on the exchange of ideas for fear of being intimidated. And the enemy isn't the state anymore, and it's not religious leaders issuing deadly edicts. The enemy is political correctness. It's liberal society itself. It's us. We're the monsters. In pursuit of our, in pursuit of ending oppression for all, uh, we're starting to oppress each other. And ground zero for this oppression is, of course, the university campus. Or so we're told. Look, okay. Free speech, campus free speech, it is a legitimate debate. And so is mob mentality, maybe more than ever. 
So I'm not, I'm not here to just wave it away. Universities are the nexus of information and opinion, and thus universities have a special obligation to encourage the free flow of ideas, including unpopular ones, which is a tradition that's mostly intact, mostly. And yes, I have heard from humanities professors here at the U of A about the unique and frustrating challenge of conducting debate and criticism in classrooms where students interpret other classmates' words as personal insults. For the students here, by the way, applaud if you've experienced this, being stifled by so-called political correctness. Okay. Can you get them to the gulags? I don't. No, it's, 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 it's legit. I mean, it, it's, it's difficult to conduct conversations when people are yelling oppressor and racist at you, and they don't really explain why. But how much is this happening, really? And even if it is, I don't think we can let these claims of oversensitivity write off the important work of activists, student activists, in raising the public consciousness on transgender rights, on carding abuses, on white nationalism, on truth and reconciliation, on campus rape. I mean, I don't think I would be exaggerating to say that you can draw a direct line from the conversations about sexual assault started on university campuses, to the Me Too movement that's purging sexual predators from politics, entertainment, and media. So spare me your snowflake insults. I mean, if you, you think snowflakes move the needle on sexual assault, I mean, how much courage do you think it takes to lay charges and face your assailant? To, to open yourself up to the scrutiny of police or skillful defense lawyers, these women aren't snowflakes. They're baseball-sized hailstones. Further, we need to be careful not to let this cultural war automatically rebrand the right to assembly as a form of speech suppression, even when the tactic itself physically amounts to it. And I'll use a historical example. In 1939, when uh, in, in London, there was an event called the Battle for Cable Street. This is when leftists, in solidarity with Jews, created a human blockade to stop Br the British Union of Fascists from marching through the Jewish quarters. It seems like legitimate free speech to me, and not censorship. Here, a lighter example, at the U of A, counter-protesters to a pro-life group surrounded their displays of dismembered fetuses, obstructing them with their own pro-choice signage. And they were able to do that because they outnumbered them. This is a fair, free expression, too. However, if you care about protecting liberal values, then these tactics are not going to help your cause. Not at this moment, anyway. Because Banning extremist views from your campus, legitimate as your reasons and right to petition may be, serves the far right strategy of dividing, of div their strategy of dividing their liberal opponents on the liberal value of free expression, humiliating them, casting them as buffoons, and casting them as unconstitutional. Here's what they do. They come to the university campus to stage a bit of theater in order to help bring their fringe causes to the mainstream. Not because students have that power, but because the real audience for their ideas isn't the student body to begin with. They don't have much support with the student body. The real audience is out there. It's the people watching from the outside. And it's the people following this narrative that, that a once sacred territory for free expression the university campus, the nexus of knowledge, has been corrupted. And make no mistake, this is a political strategy, and make no mistake, it's working. Free speech has always been a powerful weapon. But what the far right has done is weaponize capital F free speech, the issue, the law, by branding themselves the 
leaders of this cause, the protectors of this law, which now they call themselves the leaders of the new free speech movement. And what they do is they, they organize free speech rallies and free speech week, and they load them with people like Richard Spencer, leader of the so-called alt-right movement, who promotes a kind of, quote, white Zionism for America, quote, an ethnostate that would be a gathering point for all Europeans. Another free speech warrior is American provocateur Ann Coulter, who said, amongst many, many, many bigoted things, Jews need to be, quote, perfected into Christians. Or University of Alberta alumnus and former Gateway columnist Ezra Levant, the rebel commander. I don't know if I'm supposed to I do that. He took six months to apologize for a minutes-long TV tirade on Romani people that included this. Quote, gypsies are not a race. They're a shiftless group of hobos. They rob people blind. Their chief economy is theft and begging. For, century, for centuries, these roving highway gangs have mocked the law and robbed people, robbed their way across Europe. Now, call me triggered, but that sounds like it could maybe meet the legal definition of hate speech which is rarely enforced. Now, other free speech crusaders that come to mind are Faith Goldie, fired from the rebel media for, get this, being too extreme, palling around with neo-Nazis, and Gavin McInnes, who left the rebel, but also says Palestinians are stupid Rottweilers. Now, if, if they were coming under the banner of anti-Sharia week or white nationalist day, there might be a different narrative unfolding on campuses in the mainstream press. Instead, they appear under the free speech banner, allowing for this narrative to take hold. If you stand in opposition to them, you're in opposition to free speech and thus democratic values. And this is what I mean by the weaponization of the issue of free speech. Censure them, exercise your right to protest, boycott, or yes, even petition venues to withdraw an invitation to host them. That's to be in violation of society's highest ideal. Go one step further and censure them, outnumber them on a university campus, and you've now proven yourself in violation of academia's highest ideals. <clears throat> I'll give you an example of how this works. Canadian example. Eight years ago, Ann Coulter did a Canadian tour. Now, these were not going to be cordial debates with people on the other side of the spectrum, shake hands, engage in some civil arguments. Uh, it's Ann Coulter on a book tour, interviewed by Ezra Levant. Where do you think the conversation's going? But fine. So the University of Ottawa academic vice president sends her this letter ahead of time that says, I hereby encourage you to educate yourself, if need be, as to what is acceptable in Canada and to do so before your planned visit here. Promoting hate against any, any identifiable group would not only be considered inappropriate, but could, in fact, lead to criminal charges. I think this could be a reasonable, even polite thing to share with a firebrand conservative used to speaking in a country that has no hate speech laws, and who wrote about Muslims after 9-11, we should invade their countries, kill their leaders, and convert them to Christianity. But if you see her as a political satirist, as she sometimes claims to be, sometimes, then you might see this letter as a threat, as she claimed. Fine. Nevertheless, 200 protesters came out, and it got chaotic, not violent, but loud and messy and angry as free speech often is. They were over capacity. Someone pulled a fire alarm. Don't do that. The fire alarm was turned off. There was a police presence, but there were no arrests. Eventually, Coulter herself canceled, and she immediately cried censorship. Later on that tour in Calgary, unsurprisingly, she was met with less resistance and the city was portrayed as this bastion of free speech, not a bastion of conservatism, but free speech. But what about the 200 Ottawa protesters who exercise their free expression? Why don't they get any glory? Coulter, by the way, used the same tactic at another university seven years later, last April, um, 
where she announced she'd speak, but this time had no paperwork to do so. When the university said, uh, we can't accommodate you without pro proper documentation, she cried censorship. This narrative of the free speech, free speech hating leftist student mobs is so strong now that she didn't even have to show up to perpetuate it. And she gets away with it because the mainstream press overlooks young activists and instead smears them as stubborn and insensitive millennials with their fingers in their ears. I'll give you one more example. And I'll use this guy, Milo Yiannopoulos because he is a savage practitioner of this strategy. Everything he does is a troll operation. I mean, I'm not, I'm not even sure if he has any ideology other than sucking up as much attention as possible. So a year ago, he was scheduled to speak at, on the University of California Berkeley campus. Uh, while there were 1,500 people prepared to peacefully protest, Another 150 anti-fascist protesters in black bloc disguise, almost all of them from outside the university community, were not very peaceful. And it devolved into rioting and the police canceled the talk. On top of this, 100 faculty made a boneheaded decision to petition him to cancel, to cancel him ahead of time. And though university, the university administration rightfully ignored them, this was a terrible gesture because Berkeley isn't just any campus. It's the birthplace of the college free speech movement established in the 1960s. It's sacred land. It's why Milo Yiannopoulos chose it. It's why Ann Coulter chose it. And from that moment on, there was no more public debate about whether universities had become intolerable to free speech anymore. It was just an accepted truth. Because if it happened on Berkeley, it's happening everywhere. Now, that's not the whole story. Berkeley made uh, great efforts to accommodate and prepare for Milo's return a few months later. And this time, he was bringing a whole whack of uh, right-wing, extremist right-wing views. He was bringing Ann Coulter. He was bringing Steve Bannon. It was going to be a whole week of contrarian ideas. He was even going to hand out a Mario Savio Award, named after the civil rights leader and the face of the free speech movement, who, that's him right there, on top of a car, speaking to protesters who surrounded the police car after the police arrested a student activist. So, <laughs> here's the thing. It was not only a troll operation, it was all a mirage. The paperwork wasn't properly done in time. Guest speakers claimed they didn't even know that they were billed to speak. Steve Bannon was booked in another city. Berkeley spent $800,000 on security so that Milo Yiannopoulos can walk on campus with a massive police escort and then walk off 20 minutes later. A Berkeley staff member said it best when he said it was the most expensive photo op in the university's history. There you have it, $800,000. So that's the new free speech movement. So what, right? Uh, being a dick or a white nationalist doesn't exclude them from advocating for free speech. In fact, a lot of the loudest chess beating free speech absolutists are from extreme sides. The thing is, they're not free speech absolutists at all. I mean, I don't know if I've ever met a free speech absolutist. I don't know if they exist. But more importantly, <laughs> don't you find these free speech warriors strangely silent on other issues of today? Like the right of NFL players to take a knee during the national anthem? If he doesn't like this country, he can go to another country. There are rules for etiquette and decorum. That's Ann Coulter on why Colin Kaepernick should be banned from the NFL. She said, I'm with Trump. They constantly debase, debase journalists and journalism as fake news because it's critical of conservative issues. And delegitimizing the press, of course, is a very effective way for authoritarian regimes to suppress journalists and control information. 
But how about Canada's Bill C-51, the anti-terrorism law that legal and journalism experts for years warned lacked a definition of terrorism propaganda specific enough to safeguard our constitutional rights. Where was Ezra Levant on that? Instead, Levant and his supporters focused on M103, a motion, a motion to condemn Islamophobia and steady its effects on society. Not to round up people with unfavorable views and, and, and sentence them to hard labor, but to condemn them, censuring, not censoring. So that was their cause in 2017. Oddly, the, the anti-Semitism motion in 2015, an almost identical motion, which passed unanimously, was not their cause. And they were silent also in 2016 when the liberal government made a motion condemning again, not criminalizing, condemning the boycott divestment sanctions against Israel, that movement. So if M103 is an affront to free speech, as they claim, then aren't these crickets? They're not free speech activists. They're intellectual charlatans bottling up discrimination with a label that says equality for all. And then we have Jordan Peterson. I mean, did you think I was going to go the entire lecture without mentioning him? <laughs> Alberta's own academic rock star, student of the University of Alberta, son of the peace country, represent. Peterson, in case you've been in a year-long coma and you were just discharged from the hospital and for some reason you came here instead of to your loved ones, thank you, by the way. Um, you should go see your family. Jordan Peterson, almost overnight, went from being an obscure University of Toronto psychology professor to the most polarizing cultural critic in the world today. His cause began as a refusal to use the preferred pronouns of his transgender students, of all transgender students on campus. And he warned against Canada's Bill C-16, which would add gender identity and expression as grounds for discrimination to the Human Rights Code. And his grounds to refuse it, of course, were free speech. Now, I'm not going to get into the legal here, though many lawyers have said that this is utter bullshit, that, B -C, that Bill C-16 does not criminalize misgendering at all, but hey, until there's a test case, never say never. From this slippery slope argument, Peterson has become a free speech hero in a crusade against political correctness and academic censorship. And at the heart of, of most of what he says, because he has a lot to say, at the heart of it is this intellectualized form of misogyny. And it's made him the darling of the far right. Now, you can go see him for yourself, because he's here next week to promote his book, 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote for Chaos, which is number one on the Amazon uh, bestseller list, which, would, which is amazing and even more amazing because it beat out Michael Wolff's Fire and Fury, which was like the fastest selling nonfiction book, I don't know, ever in recent memory. It's a big book. So... If you want, you can go listen to him. You have an option to. You could go to the counter protest that was held that's, that will be held at the same time called Free Expression Party, 12 Rules of Resistance. And I thought that was pretty clever. And really, a, a really effective protest and, and more effective than canceling the initial venue at the Citadel. I'm just saying. But I separate, I, I separate Peterson from these other people for a few reasons. One, He's not as extreme as many people paint him out to be, though he's increasingly inching towards it. He regularly uses the trope of female insanity, bemoans taboos preventing men from becoming physically violent with them, and he dismisses feminist support for Muslim rights because of their, quote, unconscious wish for brutal male domination. Uh, a, a friend of mine, um, a friend of mine compared him to Ezra Levant, the ethical oil philosopher, uh, making the transition into Ezra Levant, the blowhard bigot. And we'll, we'll see. But for the time being, he's been careful enough to denounce white nationalism and keep some distance, while also letting the far right use him as the intellectual 
grandfather in their crusade to unravel liberal politics. Now, the other reason I separate Jordan Peterson is unlike him, uh, unlike, unlike them, Jordan Peterson is a skilled communicator. And he speaks in a way that transcends the ultra-conservative echo chambers. And this is why, this is the reason for his overnight popularity. He is as comfortable speaking in the classroom as he is on YouTube or to the mainstream press or on a book tour. He appeals to the masses on topics he actually has little expertise on, but don't we all do that sometimes? But this is a man who has studied his audience and thought carefully about the language that he will use to win them over. And I think this is where activists for liberal values, I think this is where they fail in their fight against right-wing extremism. Because they rely too heavily on academic concepts that people outside their echo chambers haven't yet accepted. And frankly, many within their echo chambers still don't know what they're talking about. Structural oppression. Is, it's an interesting term. And it's probably useful for advancing academic knowledge. Maybe. I don't know. I'm not a cultural studies student or professor. I never attended a university, honestly. Um, I did, however, recently sit in a public lecture on Muslim extremism. At least that's what I thought it was about. The professor went on about silent violence, structural violence, hubristic violence, all these different forms of violence, and everything was being essentialized. What? Some students seemed to understand him because their questions were equally baffling, but it seemed to me like so many more people in the room didn't know what the fuck he was talking about. And Peterson would call this postmodernist language, or neo-Marxism, a simpler term like neo-Marxism itself, is jargon. It serves its purpose for the studied, but skillful communication is required to bring ideas to the mainstream. And so, too many in the social justice movement want to go straight to calling something violent and oppressive without doing the work of contextualizing how and why. An example of this would be cultural appropriation. We see it in the news, often to ridicule its very notion, but I'm guessing the average Canadian, the cooks, the tradespeople, the business owners, the newcomers, my parents, they don't know what cultural appropriation means, let alone when it's a legitimate issue. It kind of reminds me of high school math. You guys uh, remember you, you could have the right number at the end of the equation all you wanted, but you had to show your work? If you're going to label ideas, or more carefully, people as racist, oppressive, violent, sexist, you've got to show how you got to that conclusion. And if you don't, prepare yourself for them to throw it right back in your face. And the other lesson with Jordan Peterson is that he doesn't always appeal, I would say he never appeals to people's guilt. Instead, he, he perceives, he appeals to what, what his audience perceives to be their highest individualistic values, whether it's free expression or self-determination, for instance. And I think there is something to learn about from that. You can, appeal, you can appeal to people's shame. Um, sure, it gets, gets tired and insulting and it gets personal, but it's much more effective to appeal to their sense of compassion and empathy. How do you make them see themselves in your cause? Now, while I don't accept this narrative that there's a, a crisis of free speech, I do think there's a crisis of compassion, which is preventing us from having the very serious debate about hate speech that we should be having right now. And so, which is, the question is, how did we make it socially acceptable again? Better yet, how do we make it socially unacceptable again? Without infringing on people's institutional and informal rights, how do we convince them that no, these are not just words, not no big deal, because words are weapons? 
That's a platitude, right? Of course words are weapons. Like all weapons, they can be used to empower and they can be used to disempower. It depends at whom the speech is pointed. And this isn't just a poetic notion of language. This is core to early childhood development. Words can protect and words can hurt. And this is why we discourage bullying, you know, for instance, or and why, why we encourage children to speak up when they see bullying. It's why kids today use the tiger version of eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and not the other version. Because someone had to explain to them that the other version hurts people. In examples that seem extreme to us in Canada, words are directly related to violence all the time. In Pakistan, in Egypt, there's heinous persecution of Christians by people emboldened by hate speech in mosques, in media, in politics. And they dehumanize Christians and convince their audience that they're a grave enough threat to justify vigilantism. Or in Myanmar, where the same magazine that was honored with the International Press Freedom Award for its pro-democracy writing regularly debases Rohingya Muslims as dark-skinned, queue-jumping, non-citizen boat people. Now, I'm not trying to cast these countries as examples of laissez-faire free speech run amok. Obviously, these are countries with severe free speech violations. These are, Pakistan has blasphemy laws, for instance. And Myanmar right now is holding two Reuters journalists on espionage charges because they tried to report the truth on the Rohingya ethnic cleansing. So yes, free speech is still a good disinfectant. But that, that might be an ineffective disinfectant when you're dealing with majority tyranny. And this is the unique moment of hate speech in Canada and much of the West right now. Society has made, it ex made an exception for Muslims. You can dress it up. You can say that Muslims, it's, it's not about Muslims, but Islam itself, that Islam is an ideology, not a race. But at the end of the day, you're generalizing 1.7 billion people and 1 million Canadians as suspicious. And by the way, when Nazis were justifying anti-Jewish discrimination, they argued the inverse, that Judaism isn't religion, it's a race, race is science, get rid of them. This isn't to be taken lightly. Many of the Western world's hate speech laws were formed in reaction to widespread anti-Semitism. And now it's starting to look a lot the same. That's a 1939 cartoon in a Viennese, uh, Viennese newspaper. That's a 2017 cartoon in a British newspaper, a popular British newspaper. Rats. A, a common icon of infiltrators, of disease, of undesirable humans. So, <clears throat> we find ourselves in a similar moment. And we have to think carefully about that question again. What is the balance? Especially for this unprecedented media revolution when the transfer of hate speech is wickedly fast and wide and the usual controls for censor censoring them seems to just devolve into a, a, a pissing match, really, that goes nowhere, and, and it only makes people double down on their opinions because nobody likes to be embarrassed in public. And free speech is as much a responsi responsibility as it, as it is a right, but the internet has made more people irresponsible with that speech, quick to slander, to attack, to threaten, to dox, and this happens on both sides of the political spectrum. And you can say that free speech is so, cheap, so free today that it's cheap. And meanwhile, hate speech, to meet the legal threshold, is like mining for Bitcoin. You need brute force. It must be speech made in a public place, against an identifiable group, and likely to lead to a breach of peace. And charges can only be laid if the attorney general consents. 
So convictions are rare, and the system is unprepared to deal with the current circumstances. So how do we strike a balance that's unique for today? We could maybe consider reintroducing human rights tribunals that gave special treatment to online hate speech before they were dismantled six years ago. This was section 13. And the liberals are reconsidering that today. And if they decide to, and the public supports it, which will be a difficult task, because they, they supported dismantling it for the most part, then we're gonna have to be careful to make sure that these tribunals don't crumble under a pile of frivolous complaints again. And we may, we may choose then uh, to work with what we have, as it is, uh, but ask our politicians to raise the penalty or lower the penalty. Instead of a fine or jail time, it's court-ordered community service for the people of the targeted identifiable group. We may ask politicians to enforce the law more frequently or decide that enforcing it is too high a cost to our own civil rights. We may become more vigilant in reporting it on social media platforms, volunteer for groups already engaged in this kind of work, or ask our government to work with platforms to weed out language and pictures that meet the legal definition of hate speech, but not necessarily require an attorney general. We may not trust companies enough for that power. I don't have the answer, and I don't think that anyone in this room has the answer, but the limits on free speech is something we should be debating and not dismissing as another censorship issue. Nobody likes censorship, and, and not just because it's stifling and way more oppressive than, than, than not. Uh, it's because it usually has the opposite effect. It popularizes the unsayable. Language becomes more powerful when it meets resistance. And we have to keep that in mind, too. I recently spoke with uh, Nikita Valerio, who's a U of A grad who studied the Jewish Holocaust and is a, a research fellow at the Tesla Institute for Muslim Canadians. And she's studying what Muslim organizations today can learn from Jewish, or, Jewish organizations who combated anti-Semitism for decades. Now, these Jewish organizations were vigilant in fighting anti-Semitic speech, or what was perceived to be, even at the behest of journalists who, like myself, get annoyed that criticisms of the Israeli government or Zionism are often just dismissed as racist. Perhaps more important to this work, though, was their educational efforts. Teaching people about the dangers of racism with Holocaust memorials and having Holocaust survivors touring schools. They had art and culture that humanized Jewish people. And this is valuable work very valuable work to combating discrimination and the social tolerance of hateful speech. At the same time, we shouldn't just throw up our hands and say there's nothing more we can legally do. And we certainly shouldn't say that if we have more massacres like the Quebec City Grand Mosque. If, if that were true, that there's, there's nothing more we can do, then we wouldn't have already drawn the lines in free speech that we have on child pornography, for, issue, for instance. I mean, we don't think of this as a free speech issue anymore, but the legal scholars who shaped the law to hinder child, expo child sexual exploitation in child pornography, for them it was a free, it was a free speech debate. And we, we also draw lines on terrorism propaganda, as well as hate propaganda that advocates genocide. It has a much more specific definition than the former. And we draw a line on capital H hate speech. But to get that capital H, it has to meet a very, very high bar. So often what's taken into account is not just the message, but the audience, the impact it's likely to have. So for justification, it has to look something like this. This is uh, Kevin J. Johnston, a uh, YouTube personality or, or citizen journalist, if you will. and. He was uh, recently arrested and charged and convicted for hate speech. Pretty obvious why. But what about this? Who's Kevin? I don't know. He's just one Edmontonian I saw do it. 
He's just one Edmontonian who feels comfortable enough to share hateful, violent memes under his real name, which doesn't seem to matter much on its own because it's only got one like. But what happens when there are many, many more Kevins? When, when I do a reverse Google search of this, images, of this meme, I get 22,600,000 results. Individually, it matters little. But when you turn a blind eye toward hate speech, dismiss it as just words or pictures, and you allow it to fester in the public sphere, it signals to people that it's socially acceptable to now act on our prejudices. So the question is, what are we going to do about that? Thank you. And after all that, you're going to make me keep talking? Oh my. Thank you so much. That was oh, thank you. remarkable. And particularly because you have identified so many of the dimensions of the problem that leaders face today, that everybody faces today, but that, um, you know, we were talking the other day that communication is the essence of leadership. How do you communicate? Uh, we may know people by our words. Words make a difference. And you've identified some of the extraordinary barriers to the kind of communication yeah. that we need to have, the, 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 uh, the free speech uh, conundrum. And so I want to just mention a couple of things and open up to questions, because you've, you've made so many very interesting points. Maybe I'll just go to a couple of the top ideas that I had. When we talk about how do we fight back against hate speech, um, you talked about the work that a lot of uh, Jewish groups had done in terms of trying to uh, educate about Holocaust history. But it seems to me that this is really a core. Um, I was at a, a, a gathering uh, a couple of months ago in Victoria, and we were talking about a more diverse future. And I said, to have a more diverse future, we need to diversify our history. And so, much, so many people are missing from history as we tell it. Um, and so when people talk about having Women's History Month or Black History Month, and we should be having Muslim History Month, people are absolutely ignorant about the role that people unlike themselves played in history. Yeah. Yeah. So you say, some people are, well, what did Muslims ever do? And I go, ever heard of algebra? Well, I mean, we Stop can... Stop and think, algebra. Mm. We, can, we can go... If we want to just talk about the legacy in North America, this is an interesting question. Uh, um, most people, I, I think a lot of people think that Muslim immigration to this country is a recent phenomenon. Um, it's not. Smarter people say, well, you know, they came in the late 1800s and early 1900s in, in large numbers. It's not that either. Up to 30% of uh, slaves to North and South America were Muslim, right? Um, they, it, it's, it's believed that, uh, it's, it's not believed, it's known that a lot of them did uh, documentation for their slave owners in, in Arabic. Um, a lot of them tried to observe Ramadan while slaves. Um, th there, were, there were slave revolts in Brazil um, that, were, uh, that were led by, by Muslim people. And uh, you know, I think this, this, is, this is important. We, because I think this, this changes the whole narrative right now, that this is a recent phenomenon, that we don't know what we're getting into. No, we do. 500 years. I mean, we can, we can talk about um, indentured Muslim uh, servants who came from, from India to the Caribbean. And, and shaped um, Indo, you know, Indo-Caribbean and, and Caribbean culture. Uh, Muslim history is as much a part of this, these continents' DNA as Jewish history, Chinese history. Um, <laughs> so, I, so you know, I, I guess, I guess my point is, um, I agree with you. <laughs>
It's usually a pretty safe position to take. Uh, okay. Yeah. But it, but it is this point that we, we know, you know, I'm of British heritage. Mm -hmm. So obviously, three of my grandparents were born in Scotland. And on the fourth side, I'm eighth generation Canadian, 11th generation North American. So I probably, <laughs> my family probably offended a lot of people. But the point is that, you know, I always felt I belonged mm -hmm. and I admired uh, and I still admire much of the British tradition of creating law and government, whatever. But you see things through that narrow scope and yeah. the role of indigenous people. I had, had a friend uh, at graduate school whose wife was doing a PhD on Canadian history at Queen Mary College because the Hudson's Bay archives were in London. And um, she was doing her PhD thesis on the role of what we then called Indian women, First Nations women in opening up the West, because many of the, the um, fur traders and explorers, uh, your, British most of them, or French, married, took mm. Indian wives. And these women were, played a very important role. Do you ever see them? No. The other, th so, I, I, so we've, we've established that the part of the problem is if we are going to humanize people and make it harder make, for, for these attacks to take root. We need to make them part of our history. We have to make them part of our history. They are part of our history. We simply you know, need to notice them. And it's like I, I, every time I see some woman who's done an amazing thing or an obituary of some woman who was an amazing thing yeah. in science, I always retweet it and say, you know, too bad women aren't cut out for tech. And I go hashtag Google moron <laughs> um, because of that guy. But the point is. You're doing God's work. You know, they're there. I am. But the other thing I wanted, I wanted to mention, um, is another challenge we have, which are algorithms. And what we have online now are algorithms which bias the nature yeah. of searches, which buy, you know, that, that, that they, the YouTube algorithms now that bias, that are biased in favor of controversy and divisiveness. So when people were doing searches, say for Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump, yeah. they would get these negative, uh, slanderous uh, videos about Hillary Clinton. And interestingly enough, there wasn't much uptake among liberals for similar things about Donald Trump, but there was a huge uptake among conservatives for such things about Hillary Clinton. Now, I'm not saying it's because liberals are better, but it may be that there was something in their outlook that made them just more skeptical. Or maybe they said, look, there's enough true stuff about Donald Trump. I don't need to read this phony stuff. I don't know. Well, um, I mean, he, I, I think he... Um Politicians are guilty of this all the time. They, they appeal uh, to outrage. Um, Donald Trump uh, did, the, I mean, wow, can he ever appeal to outrage? And so, um, I mean, that's, that's, that's the core audience. And, and part of that also is because you had a, you had a Democratic president. And you know, the, so the, the opposite, the uh, opposing political side is obviously going to feel uh, more pent up anger. Um, I don't know why it hasn't subsided, um, but uh, the, it is interesting that these, these algorithms, um, they, they are, in a way, working to uh, reinforce our outrage. If you, if you put YouTube, uh, if you just let it work, if you just let it do its own thing, it, and you, um, if, if you're watching you know, videos that, that debase the other side of the political spectrum or debase uh, minorities, and you just let YouTube do its thing, it's going to give you more. And more yeah. and more and more. It's like it's like you know bottomless pop. Um, and, and and even if you're what you're you're googling or what you're trying to see are like elephants or something. The next thing you know, you'll see these very divisive. It's not about elephants, but about yeah. you know other subjects. What, one one last thing I want to raise because I know everybody wants to ask questions. But when you talked about Jordan Peterson and the whole question of the the new gender pronouns for transgender people. You know, it really took me back because I understand that, you know, when, when these new types of awareness come into society, it's hard for people to adjust. And I remember when people were apoplectic about Ms. <laughs> you know, when women of my generation said, hey, rather than identifying us as Miss or Mrs., which indicates whether we're married or not, why couldn't we just be Ms.? And interestingly, the first iteration of Ms., I think, was back in 1913. It didn't catch on. Well, now everybody is Ms., because yeah. it's easier. But, you, but it was a kind of a Jordan Peterson kind of reaction that people had. When, can, I, can I share a story? When, uh, when I first went to college, um, just right out of high school. I went from growing up in High Prairie, um, very, very conservative town, to Vancouver. And um, I, I, I used the word um, caveman with a, uh, with a woman 
very progressive woman. And she said, uh, mm, cave people. <laughs> and I thought that this was the stupidest thing I'd ever been asked to do in my life. Um, a few years later, started using cave people. I mean, I don't write about cave people a lot, but like when, when it crosses my word processor, I don't even think about it anymore. And I think what that boils down to is when, when I was a little kid, we were told to say, sticks and stones can break my bones, but names will never hurt me. That's a bad thing to teach kids because words really do matter. Sure. They determine how we think about things. And, uh, and the language, uh, as you're talking about, is absolutely fundamental. And so whether we're calling people Ms. or whether, I remember when I was, chair, I was the chairperson of the Vancouver School Board. And there was a whole question, you know, was I, and I said, I don't want to be called a chair. I'm not a piece of furniture, but I'll be a chairperson. <laughs> um, but, you know, and, and again, in those days, I mean, it was still a big deal. And now, I mean, I'm sure our, our students are going, oh, you know, well, this is pretty boring. Why are you talking about that? Because when you look at the Jordan Peterson thing, a lot of it is the people pushing back against the enlargement of rights, the enlargement of understanding. Transgenderism is something that has become much more uh, upfront and understood, and you know we, we attempt to try and understand what the what the, these challenges are and how people want to be treated, and uh, it's hard for some people. But instead yeah, of being and, kind, he's mean. Well, and, and, you know, kind mean, I, I just wish that um, people talked about it not as a uh, matter of free speech or censorship, but just as a matter of respect. Because that's, that's essentially what they're asking for. And if, uh, I, mean, the, and, and the, I mean, this is also one of those things that is just exaggerated as an issue. I've never, ever had a person who was transgendered, or, or I, I knew them to be, or didn't know them to be, asked me to use a different pronoun with them. I mean, how, how often are you coming up against this? So if it's rare, then why not just do the respectful thing and, and use it? Yeah. I, like, I, I don't get why it's such an affront to people. Yeah. Maybe he has limited bandwidth. Um, anyway. <laughs> So now uh, I'm going to ask us. We're running late, and I apologize, you know, because that happened as a result of the, oh, the live yeah. streaming. Oh, boy. So normally we would be uh, uh, heading off at, at almost this time. So let's have questions from the audience till about 22, shall we? Um, and then our students will go off and do their master class. But we have the wonderful uh, airborne microphone that we throw around. So make yourselves visible. And I, it's very hard for me to see because of the light in my face. So I'll try and make. Okay. That microphone Whoa. is so cool. That's okay. the best thing in the world. All right. Um, thanks for the talk. I wrote down my question for brevity. Oh, thanks. Uh, for everyone around Very me. respectful. Yes. So uh, you, you said there were three things um, for hate speech to be prosecuted. Uh, yeah. Like to be able to, could you just repeat those again? Okay. Um, it has to be said in a public place, so it can't be a private conversation. Okay. Um, the second thing is that it has to be against an identifiable group, um, inciting, uh, inciting violence against an ins uh, identifiable group. And, um, oh, goodness. You can look at your notes. If you I know. can look at my notes. Jeez. A approved by the Attorney, Gen yeah, yes, the okay. attorney, attorney General consents uh, to the charges. Okay. Thank you. So, all right. So, um, uh, growing up Muslim, I've participated in Friday and Taraweeh prayers, where we ask God to give us the strength to raise armies and expel the Jews from the Holy Land. Yeah. Not Israelis, not Israeli, is Israeliin, but Yehudis. Mm -hmm. This was not in Pakistan. This was not in Egypt. This was right here in Edmonton, a couple blocks away from here. Upon reflection, I realized that our anti-Semitic genocidal sheikhs were calling for the ethnic cleansing of a religious group which has already suffered a massive pogrom not long ago, and you've mentioned that. You've made a case that free speech has been weaponized by white fascists, and fair enough, man, I get it. My question is, does that include fascism of the Islamic variety, like the ones I've witnessed firsthand? And if so, what should be the punishment? Yeah, it should. It, it absolutely includes them, of course. Um, I mean, the, the punishment is that 
I, I, th I think maybe we should enforce the law. We should, maybe we should enforce the law a little bit more for, for, for everyone. That, I mean, that's, we, I mean we, we have the law, but the, the thing is that we've, we've raised the bar so high and with, with good intentions, but at this particular moment, it's worth debating whether the bar needs to be lowered just a titch, just enough that situations like this where you have um, Islamofascist community leaders, so they are of great influence, speaking to a congregation of people so they have a great audience, um, that debases and dehumanizes um, a, an ethnic group, a, a, and one that's had a target on it for hundreds of years. Thank you. I You're appreciate welcome. that. Yeah. Have we got somebody else who's going to catch the famous green microphone? Yeah. yeah, I'm just going to walk it to you. <laughs> oh, it's more fun when you throw it, Kelly. That's all. Hi. Um, so I got your position on this whole narrative of like free speech on campuses being like um, quashed upon by leftists to be highly exaggerated, right? Mm -hmm. um, Is but, that been your experience? Yes, but my question is, is that if you look in any editorial from like the Golden Mail or the National Post, it almost seems like that it's almost like campuses are a war zone where yeah. free speech doesn't exist. Um, so my question yeah. is, you've talked about like the hate groups themselves who seem to weaponize free speech. Yeah. But I'm wondering what's the media's role in perpetuating that narrative. Um, in a yeah. podcast, you've, you've contemplated being, about- Being um, more objective on the issue. Yeah. And it's very hard. As, as, um, as you were saying, um, it's very difficult for people to look beyond their, vero, their, their narrow viewpoint. <clears throat> and that's true of journalists, too. I mean, when, it, when, when we're, you're talking about something that uh, defines your profession, um, it's, it's hard to objectively report on things that are in opposition to that. Um, and it's, I think it's especially difficult to find uh, to find more objective reporting on the issue um, because Canadian media in Canada is largely white. And that's, I mean, that's, that's the truth, right? So, and, I mean, and it's not something that I used to uh, think about very much until uh, I started to look, until we reached a point where I looked like the person that is being uh, targeted quite frequently in hate speech. And then it shifted my perspective. Because I also used to be um, much more, I think, subjective on the issue of free speech. Uh, I'm much more interested in hearing what other people have to say on it now. It's outside my, outside my community. Can I make a point about this? Because one of the things that I've always hated is people using my virtues against me, you know, being rude, knowing that I, <laughs> well, knowing that I won't, will not respond the same way. Yeah. And one of the challenges democracies have is that the enemies of democracy use the institutions of democracy to undermine it, whether it is by you know, trying to get people elected who are anti-democratic and then undoing it. You know, tyrants always want to describe themselves as being democratic. Putin's going to great lengths <laughs> to be re-elected as president of, of Russia. You give me a break, folks. And so th this whole weaponization of free speech is part of this phenomenon that free speech, I mean, particularly in the American Constitution, you know, the, yeah. the First Amendment, I mean, it, it is the, the, the ne plus ultra. And so people take the value that they know you have and use it against you. And you have to be pretty savvy and pretty astute not to let that happen. And I think what you're talking about today is, you know, how do we do that? How do we keep that from happening? Mm -hmm. How do you dis I mean, how do you disarm them yeah. of that? And I think yeah. it is important that um, you take that strategy um, into consideration and um, take that ability for them to, to call you uh, anti-free speech away from them uh, by engaging with them in a civil discourse. And sometimes, and, and it's hard because we're talking about people that we think are kind of dangerous now and not just uh, obnoxious, but 
sometimes the principles, I mean, for example, many years ago, there was a, a neo-Nazi march through Skokie, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. It's very Jewish. And you know, people wanted to stop it. But the, the principle that enabled it to go ahead was also the principle that allowed the publication of the Pentagon Papers. So sometimes these you know, legal principles are protecting something that you believe in and the importance of free speech. Yes. And sometimes it's, it's awful. And I think one of the things about free speech is that it is free freedom to be annoyed and offended. Yeah. And, and you know, one of the, one of the most famous um, civil liberties lawyers in, uh, in Canada who, uh, who fought for, uh, fought for free speech, he actually represented a lot of uh, white supremacists and people in hate groups because his, his rationale was if you could use it against them, then you could use it against me. Yeah. So that's well, what, can, can I ask you, mm -hmm. when, when you were prime minister, when you were a political leader, what was the free speech issue of that time? Gosh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I really don't remember yeah. Something is really standing out that way. I mean, lots of people said offensive things, but I don't. Oh, um, well, maybe hate speech, Holocaust denial, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. But it wasn't really on the front page. But I just wanted to, to say, you know, when we talk about you know, how courts have dealt with this, uh, Supreme Court Justice, American Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis once talked about, you know, there's freedom of speech, but you can't shout fire in a crowded theater. That's not yeah. freedom of speech. And I think what we're talking about here now are forms of speech which are a bit like shouting fire in a crowded theater because they seem to be giving people permission to act out. And there's a whole, there's just some yeah. news that are not, has been talking about, there's been a whole array of violent killings in the United States now by white right-wingers. And the media don't seem to want to connect the dots sure. that this is actually a violent movement that is, that is uh, uh, taking people's lives. Yeah, and I mean, I think some. I mean, I think something that maybe hasn't been said loudly enough today. Um, it it deserves to be said that we we have we do have a problem with uh, we do have a problem with outrage, right? Mm -hmm. As a culture, and so sometimes we 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 become outraged so often that we forget how to react to things that are truly, truly horrendous. And I mean, I, I just wish that, that we, we had a way of changing that. It just seems so, because so much of our, our conversations about anything happen online, it's just so easy to take everything as a personal attack and to overreact and then when there are very frightening things like, you know, burn your local mosque being shared out in the public. We don't, we just dismiss it as just, oh, another offensive thing. I'll take one more question and then we'll, we'll adjourn tonight, but it's been a very interesting conversation that we could go on for weeks and weeks. There we go. Okay. Hi. Hi, Tama. Hi. It seems to me that perhaps part of the problem that hasn't really been addressed fully here is the role of the media mm -hmm. and, and the structure of our media that makes it rewarding for them to inflate all these things. I mean, if the media had just treated Trump the way he should have been treated, which was ignored, he wouldn't be the president right now. Yeah. So how do we deal with that fundamental problem? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Can I do next year's yeah. communication lecture too? For that one, we have to climb up a very steep mountain and find a guy in the lotus position sitting there. I mean, uh, I'll, I'll offer this. It's, gonna, it's not going to sound like much, but it does mean something because journalists are people too. Write them. <laughs> Write them. You have their email addresses. You have their, you know what? Better than just tweeting them about it, because um, they get tweeted a lot. They don't always have time to look through them. And also because they're, again, they're, I mean, they're just so used to outrage that, and also because 280 characters, you know, thanks, thanks for doubling up, but like it's still not enough for some right. issues, right? Yeah. You, you need at least 300. <laughs> um, you need to so, spread your tweets. So email them, because journalists don't get 
a lot of reasonable emails. <laughs> and if you write them a reasonable argument about why they, you think that they can be doing their jobs better to serve the public good better and to get to, uh, and get to the truth of things, they will read them. Yeah. They might not respond. <laughs> <laughs> but that also gets us into the question of the economics of the news industry now right. <laughs> and what it takes to get people's eyes. And I think that really it's, un it's up to us to reward those, who, the thoughtful journalists, the ones who are doing the in-depth reporting to, by subscribing to their newspapers, yeah. by supporting them, yeah. and saying, this is what we want. Uh, because at the end of the day, if they're not you know, yeah. selling the ads and yeah. they can't make, make a living, what you're going to get is the tabloid uh, crazy stuff. Yeah. This has been a wonderful Thank conversation. You. And we could continue it for a long time. <laughs> what a pleasure. What a pleasure. So.